On today's episode. Telemedicine is, for example, one thing that's really sort of is quite fascinating during this crisis. Now we have the technology in place to leverage telemedicine from a completely different scale that we have done uh, historically because I think it's a little bit of a habit, you know. I'm, I'm used to going to see my doctor and I don't necessarily sort of break that habit unless I have to. Welcome to the Active Share podcast that explores less obvious investing insights in a world that's always changing. I'm your host, Hugo Scott Gall. Hello and welcome to today's podcast, which is part two of our COVID-19 science and economics series. I have with me Camilla Oxama cruz who is one of our global healthcare analysts. She has a PhD in infectious diseases, which is extremely important right now. I'm sure you'll agree. Also with me is Olga Vitell. Olga is our global equity strategist. Hello, Olga. Hello, Camilla. Thank you for having us. Okay, well, let's get going and let's dive straight in. Let's start with a question to you, Camilla, around serology testing. What is it? What have we learned? And what else do we need to know? That's a great, great question, great way to start a podcast because it's a hot topic at the moment. So as you know, we have several different kind of testing. Testing is something that has been debated a lot. Let's first take a step back and discuss what are all these tests and what are they used for? So we have diagnostic tests, obviously. They can either be based on PCR or antibody tests. Then we have a serology tests that are also evaluating the antibody that the patient developed due to the virus. A serology test is uh, done to determine the underlying spread of the disease in the society. It's usually done sort of in hindsight and to post the, after the infection, a uh, determine sort of the, the true spread of the virus and to what extent also the population has developed antibodies to the virus. This is a very important part of us understanding the virus, how it has spread through the society, who has indeed been infected, and also importantly, who is now immune to the virus. It does not, however, tell us how long this immunity will last, and that's sort of a critical point. So now these different serology tests are being rolled out, and we will start over the next coming weeks and months, see sort of more serology analysis. And we've already, as you mentioned, started to see some coming out. Uh, New York is, is one of those serology tests that we have seen data from. We've seen New York, some in Germany as well, I think. You're the expert here. I know a lot less than you. But from New York's tests, it suggested that as much as 25% of the population of New York City would test positive for having had COVID-19. But if you look out to New York State, it's much lower. But the thing I'm kind of struggling with is, even if it was 25%, predictions are that actually most of a, a majority of a population will eventually get COVID-19. So if I'm going to start worrying about the second wave, I think there's a lot to start worrying about there, because if so far it's only 25% and herd immunity is up at 70%, 80%, this sounds like a second wave is going to be very potent, if not more potent. I know that I know as much as you, but what am I missing? Let's dissect this a bit and first start talking about what came out of this study and how reliable is this data. So the serology test in New York shows that in New York City, approximately 25% of the population has been infected by this virus and have some sort of antibodies against COVID-19. Outside uh, New York City, the frequency is a little bit different. Overall in the state, I believe it was around 15%, but in the less populated area was as low as 3 to 4%. So that is one interesting findings to discuss that we have seen that not only in New York, but in other parts of the country in the world, that the virus is particularly prevalent in highly dense populations. So the more dense area, the easier it is for the virus to spread. That's one takeaway. And then sort of in less populated areas, the spread of the virus is less frequent. This study is it's the first study that, it, that has come out is, uh, from New York. It's a rather small study. It's about, in total, 7,500 cases that has been, or people that has been evaluated. I do think that if we compare the data to some of the epidemiology models, they are pretty much in line. So it would surprise if 
if we do additional serology testing in New York, that the numbers will be completely off. So let's stick with the number 25% approximately in New York state. And so that tells us that 25% of the population in New York City has developed some sort of antibody response to COVID-19. We don't know, however, how long lasting that immunity will last. So we're talking about six months, we're talking about a year. Can we have some sort of partial protection thereafter? So there are a lot of questions we still don't really know. And that, of course, uh, when we're talking about a potential second wave and how this will protect us, 25% should these 25% of the population has a thorough immunity towards the virus. It will create some resistance for the virus to spread, but it doesn't create a herd immunity. Herd immunity would eventually sort of eradicate the virus. That is not what we're talking about. 25% will create resistant, but not herd immunity. I still think that we don't know enough about how solid this immunity truly is to be able to conclude that 25% of New York's city's population is truly immune to this virus. So more study on the immunity needs to be done to be able to sort of uh, make that conclusion. What we can say now and what we can calculate more correctly is now on the mortality rate. We know now that 25% of New York City has been infected. We know sort of how many that passed away, approximately how many have passed away from COVID-19. So now we can start calculating better on sort of the true mortality rate. And when I did sort of a very quick calculation, it seems that mortality rate is in the range of about 05 to 0.7%. So significantly lower than those sort of uh, data is coming out if we just calculate on their diagnosed cases. Sure. sure. But going back to my getting worried about a second wave coming, certainly in Europe and, and, and the US in the fall into the winter in the Northern Hemisphere, why shouldn't I be worried about that? We've, we've still got quite low infection rates across populations. We've seen that, I mean, healthcare systems would have learned from the first wave clearly, but it feels like if this virus rolls around the world following winter, it comes back with a vengeance in fall and winter, and we get a very disrupted second wave that could lead back to where we are now. We're in early May and we're talking, you know, with most countries are in lockdown or just talking about easing, a very initial easing of lockdown. So talk me through your thinking around this idea of, of a second wave that could be sure. as destructive as the first. So I do think that our base case scenario should be that the virus will, to some extent, come back this fall as you said, given the spread of the virus, not only here in the US, but also globally, I find it highly unlikely that the virus will completely disappear this summer, as SARS, uh, for example, did in back in, in 2003. The way that I think that it will, or a couple of scenarios here that we can discuss. So I do think it's likely that we will see a slowdown of the infection rate during the summer, and then that the activity of the virus will start to increase again sometime this fall, probably around October, November, sort of when similar viruses start emerging. We have other seasonal coronaviruses, influenza viruses, they usually start occurring in, in October, November. So I do think that we will likely see an increase of activity this fall. Then the magnitude of the second wave is, of course, the millennial question here. So what's very important to highlight here is that the more we contain the virus now, before and during the summer, the better we can contain the situation during the fall and the better off we will be in the fall when the virus sort of the activity of the virus start increasing. So in other words, that the more we suppress the virus, the easier it will be to contain it this fall and therefore prevent that it will translate into a broad community and therefore another sort of major outbreak. And of course, we can talk about the preparedness of the society, the preparedness of the healthcare system. But if we just sort of I talk about the likelihood that we will have another major outbreak, I think that we can, what we do now in order to suppress it very much will be a guideline sort of of how, to what extent uh, the, the, the virus will come back this fall. Okay, so... You're saying that the longer the lockdowns last now, the more effective they are, and that reduces the impact of the second wave. So before you answer that, I do want to bring in Olga here just to 
hear your thoughts on Olga, whether having listened to Camilla and sketching out what the fall and winter could look like in terms of a second wave, how do you think that with your economist hat on, whether that is something that is expected and baked into market expectations, or whether that would be a negative surprise if what Camilla says is likely? So we'll go to you first, Olga, then go back to you, Camilla, just to answer my question around the longer the lockdowns go on now, that could reduce the impact of the second wave come winter. Hugo, as you rightly point out, the crucial question here really is whether, and to Camilla's point on infection rates going back up in the fall, whether the healthcare systems are deemed to be adequate enough to support the extra hospitalizations or the extra burden, so to speak, such that we don't require additional lockdowns. I don't think the market is currently expecting lockdowns. As you know, for now, our base case is that we won't have them, and so we'll have a gradual sequential recovery, sort of starting in mid-May or June, whenever the lockdowns really start to ease in earnest and people are able and willing, crucially, to move around and to begin to consume and resume their pre-crisis lifestyles. In the event that the second wave of epidemic proves to be as destructive as the first and necessitates its moving back up into the front headlines, I think it will negatively impact this recovery, irrespective almost of lockdowns. Of course, if we have more lockdowns, it will really severely depress activity and arrest the recovery again. But even if we don't have lockdowns, if infection rates are sufficiently high so as to prevent people from engaging in their daily lives, work, commute, consume, et cetera, in a meaningful way, then we will have a disruption in the ongoing recovery for sure. So Camilla's expectations on how the second wave is likely to evolve on our models based on how the data is coming in today and in the summer months will be critical. So coming on the on the sort of lockdown, the longer the lockdowns are now, the less impact they could be in the fall and winter. Is that right? Is that logical? I would rather say that the road back is is quite uh, crucial, and how we now go back to sort of a pre-COVID society. I think that's extremely crucial. I, I would sort of emphasize that a slow, gradual, very controlled ease of the the lockdown is extremely important so that we can contain, should there be smaller outbreaks, so-called hotspots, that we can identify them early, that we can contain them early, and therefore avoid spread, a, a broader spread in the, in the community, and therefore contain the virus outbreak. I think that's extremely crucial. So testing is very important here, that we continue to test people to identify any potential smaller outbreak and to contain them early. And then also we can talk about other measures to contain the spread of the virus. Should we should we introduce broader surveillance, temperature checks in highly dense populations? Should we use facial masks to contain the spread of the virus? Those are the questions that we, we need to address now, particularly I would say in areas that are highly, highly dense populations Because now we have the opportunity to really, before the summer and during the summer, to contain the spread so that we are better off going into the fall so that we more easily can contain uh, the virus this fall. But it's also to Olga's point that when fall arrives, we will be, as a society, much better prepared. The hospital system will be better prepared. Uh, We know now how much equipment, what kind of equipment we need and who is, in particular, who is the most vulnerable in the society so that we can better prepare and protect those that are the most vulnerable. So we are, as a society, significantly better prepared for, for a second wave. If we now also, when we move on, moving on to the next phase, uh, easing of the lockdown, if we do that gradually and very control, I think that we will be in a pretty good shape going into the fall. In, in a connected system, though, you're only as strong as... Link. Of course, in the U.S., the demographic looks a bit different because we can, of course, here in Illinois, we cannot close the border to prevent people from other states to enter in Illinois. 
So, of course, from a, a, a travel perspective, that needs to be very considered. But I do think that if we really, truly sort of roll out a broad testing and facilitate so that people can get themselves tested easily, we can identify any hotspots easily and therefore contain the situation. But first of all, we need to bring down, we further need to bring down the activity of the virus and then we can move on to the next phase. And that would be sort of to to have a broad testing, to identify outbreaks easy and contain those before they develop into a broad community spread. Okay, let's let's talk a bit more about the virus itself. Is it mutating? How does it compare to other viruses in terms of its sort of lifespan and, and its behavior and characteristics? As with other coronaviruses, so we compare with the seasonal coronaviruses and also SARS and MERS, coronaviruses tend not to be mutating as frequently as, for example, influenza viruses, which is good, uh, particularly for in a uh, vaccine development perspective. And this is also what we have seen with COVID-19. It's, of course, mutating. All viruses mutates, but it's not mutating at a significantly high rate and it has not significantly changed in its pathogenicity and characteristic as compared to what we saw early on in the uh, outbreak in, in Wuhan. So that's good, uh, particularly for uh, vaccine development. I think that the general idea is that once we have a vaccine available, it could probably be a functional vaccine for between two to four years. So it's not as compared to the influenza vaccine that we need to develop new vaccines every year, this would probably not be the case for the COVID-19. So another question I have, Camilla, is we're all armchair epidemiologists now, but swine flu. Swine flu infected a pretty high percentage of the population. I can't remember what it was. And it had a pretty high fatality rate, as in the absolute number of deaths was pretty high. That was very different. We didn't have lockdowns. We didn't have everything that's going on now. So why do we have this now? Why didn't we have it then? And how do you think about that? That's a brilliant question. And let's start talking about it from a, a, a disease perspective. So yes, the swine flu infected approximately 18% of the US population. 350,000 ended up at the hospital. So this was basically during a little bit over a year we were dealing with, with the swine flu. So of course, it, it had a huge impact on the society, had a huge impact, particularly on our hospital. Hospitals, they were literally on their knees uh, due to the burden of the swine flu. I think that the reason why we reacted somewhat different, or at least one of the reasons why we reacted a little bit different instead of doing the swine flu is because it was an influenza uh, virus. And for influenza viruses, we have a solid uh, vaccine platform. So we know that we can develop a vaccine for a, a, an influenza virus. It's just a matter of time. We also were able to develop a vaccine relatively quickly. In six months, we had a vaccine available for the broader population. So, of course, when it all emerged in the spring 2009, we didn't know exactly how quickly we would have a vaccine, but we knew that we were going to have a vaccine. When COVID-19 emerged, we didn't really know very much about the virus. We didn't know, and we still don't know for certain exactly how, how easy it will be to develop a vaccine and how quickly we can ramp up production of it. I do think that we we know significantly more now than we did two months ago, but this is this is more of a novel virus, and therefore uh, I think it was prudent to be more cautious from a society perspective because, as you've seen, this the infection rate is relatively high, maybe not as high as the swine flu, but it probably has sort of a higher mortality rate. So for those that do get infected, and particularly those that belong to any of the risk populations, there is a significant risk that the patient will not survive. So. With that uncertainty of the, the vaccine and knowing that it has a, a high infection rate and a relatively high mortality rate, I do think that the action that we have done from a society perspective has been very prudent. So when it comes so, to finding a vaccine, yeah. and does that make you more optimistic, less optimistic that the timeline, certainly the timeline people are talking about is much faster or would almost be like a, a world record for speed. So that those characteristics of the virus would make you share that optimism in terms of timeline and speed? Yeah, I think that it's sort of there, there is a lot of activity going on from a scientific development perspective. There's a lot of activity going on now uh, developing the vaccines. So I believe there are close to 
We have more than 80 different vaccine candidates in development now in different stages, obviously. They also target, so they also use different approaches for developing vaccines. So we have vaccines they're developing more using a classic or, or his sort of traditional vaccine platform. We were using also novel technologies, vector technologies on our mRNA vaccines. So a lot of different approaches, which is good because we don't really know what will be at the end of the day the most effective and which one we can scale up the most quickly. So of these 80 or something different vaccine candidates that are in development, approximately a handful are now in clinical states. So we have we probably heard of Oxford University. They have one vaccine candidate and they have been very optimistic in their outlook, saying that they could potentially have a candidate approved as early as September. Moderna, a US company, they said that they can approach phase two now or enter phase two early summer, phase three later this summer, and potentially have a vaccine candidate approved also before year end. Pfizer, BioNTech. They are also aiming to have a vaccine candidate approved this fall, saying that they could scale up production to have a million of doses available already in 2020 and 100 million doses in 2021. And Johnson & Johnson, also a a big pharmaceutical company, as you know, they could potentially have one vaccine candidate approved early 2021. So we have several, I would say, good candidates in development. And this is that could potentially get approved before uh, year end. And of course, the more candidates we have that get approval, the quicker we can ramp up manufacturing, because as you know, manufacturing is a huge bottleneck here. One of the key aspects when it comes to the vaccine for COVID-19 that I would like to highlight now as as data will start coming out from these vaccine candidates, the key is not at this stage to develop the perfect vaccine for COVID-19, at least not immediately. The, The idea is to develop a vaccine that obviously needs to be safe, very safe. But from an efficacy perspective, we don't need to hit home run at the moment. We need to have a vaccine that offers sufficient protective to prevent a good percentage of the population from getting affected. But most importantly, it needs to protect uh, people from developing severe symptoms should they get affected by the virus. So therefore, I don't think that the hurdle of developing a vaccine here is that high. I think that as long as the, the vaccine is safe, and a reasonable effective, I think that they will be good candidates for what we need at the moment. And then we can work on perfection in later generation. Okay, so having sounded a bit bearish and gloomy early on talking about the second wave, this all sounds quite good. This all sounds quite positive that actually we are going to get a vaccine that is maybe not, as you say, perfect, but is sufficiently, what's the right word, strong, has sufficient efficacy that it actually really does really does slow the spread, which would mean that actually once you've got one or maybe two of these vaccines available so that enough people, certainly the most mobile people in the world who are likely spreaders, can be vaccinated, then isn't that the all clear? Doesn't that mean we're all okay? So I'm interested in your view on that. Then I want to bring Olga in to talk about actually if that is right, that maybe at some point in the first half of 2021, we feel this is now behind us because we're either vaccinated or sufficient number of people are vaccinated that actually the spread of this is very, very unlikely. So you go first, Gwenda, then then it's time for Olga on sort of the economic consequences of that. Right, right. No, it's a good point. And I do agree that I am quite optimistic about the vaccine development. I'm quite optimistic that we will have potentially even several candidates approved before year end, that we can ramp up manufacturing relatively quickly so that we can start vaccinating those that are the most exposed, i.e. healthcare worker, frontline workers, and also those, the high-risk population. And once we have sort of vaccinated those, I, I think that we are still in a relatively good spot from a society perspective. But I do also want to highlight from where we started off on, on the second wave that, yes, even if we do get a second wave, we as the society are so much better prepared Uh, The healthcare system is much better prepared to deal with this potential second wave. And we also have not only vaccine, but we have several also drug candidates that are in development in different phases that also will help to alleviate some of the pressure. So I do think that we are, the further we go, the more we know about the virus, the better we are off should this sort of come back this fall. So I'm still sort of relatively optimistic that, that we are 
we will handle a potential second wave significantly better than, than the first wave. So, so Camilla, it Camilla, sounds like from what you're saying that the initial recovery post the lockdowns that we're currently in as they begin to relax in May and June, even if the initial recovery is somewhat underwhelming as we head into fall, as we're potentially amenable to further disruptions from the next stage of the infection rate going up, a healthcare system better prepared, possibly a plurality of vaccines. So the biggest impediment to our ongoing recovery from the medical perspective would be the fast ramp up of manufacturing ramp up really of these different vaccines. So does this argue then for a global effort in coming up with the numbers we're talking about? You recently highlighted a million in 2020, 100 million by 2021. These are really small numbers relative to the vast quantities that we need. Even if we move sort of just for the frontline healthcare workers in developed markets, but also in emerging countries, in emerging economies, we're talking about probably close to multiple hundreds of millions of vaccines, not to mention vaccinating broader swaths of population. So in which case we're talking about billions. Who has the capacity to manufacture these quantities and how, how might this work in practice? Right. So that's a very good question. And therefore, I believe that the more vaccine candidates, the more uh, companies and particularly the larger sort of pharmaceutical companies that are truly sort of have more capacity are involved, sort of the better off we will be. So I'm therefore optimistic that sort of we already now have a handful of candidates in clinical trials. Different companies are involved. And so this would be this will truly be a global effort to bring up the manufacturing capacity quickly, obviously, and also to the level that we need to vaccinate the broad uh, society. But I think that this will be probably more of a rolling development. So we will identify who will need the first doses the most. Sort of, and, and I would say the healthcare workers is probably the one that will be vaccinated the first. They are the ones that are the most exposed and are obviously critical for the society to function well. And thereafter, we will move on to the high risk population, the elderly population, those with underlying comorbidities. And the rest of us simply will sort of have to wait. But should we be infected, the the likelihood of us coming down with a severe outcome or sort of being in need of hospital care is fairly unlikely. From all the data we've seen, the vast majority of those that come down with severe symptoms of COVID-19 is that the elderly population and it's those with certain underlying comorbidities. We know that now. So the more we know about the pathogenicity of the virus, the more easily we can identify patients or, or people with that are at higher risk. And they will be sort of those that will be vaccinated first. So it sounds, based on what you're saying, that we are going to have a recovery that is more of a fits and starts in 2020. And then as we move out further into 2021 and really get a handle on this pandemic from a medical perspective, be it through vaccines, treatments, extra hospital beds, et cetera, we will then have a stronger chance at a more robust and sustainable recovery. Would that be an accurate way to to think about translating what you're saying on the medical front to how I'm thinking about economic developments, because this is really the critical variable here, our ability to conquer this and and put this behind us. Right. Yes, I I agree. So I do think from a from the hospital perspective, we, we have learned a lot and we know now how to quickly mobilize hospitals and the equipment that we need to secure the hospital because that's critical function in the society we we need to protect a hospital so that they do not get overrun i do think that given what we know from the first wave we are better off protecting our uh, hospital system should a second wave uh, emerge if we also have a better build out testing capacity and facilities for the broader population to test themselves. Potentially, sort of, you can go down to your closest Walgreens or CVS to get yourself tested. That would also be very 
helpful, impactful, as, as I mentioned earlier, then we can identify these outbreaks quicker and contain the outbreak so that it doesn't translate into a wider spread. So those are, those are critical functions to handle the next wave. And if we do that well, I think that the society will be in. I don't think that it would, the, the impact on the broader society will be as impactful as it has been during the first wave. And then towards the end of 2020 and beginning of 2021, then so we can start talking about vaccine and who will be vaccinated. And, and I think that that's where we have sort of the big, the big change in the sense that then we can really start talking about to some extent, sort of suppressing the, the, the virus to an extent that it's not really sort of going to be a problem from a society perspective. One of the things I'm interested in, Camilla, is we're, there are quite a few arguments being made for deglobalization, yet the combined effort to find a vaccine to, and, and to find ways of treating this disease is very globalizing. It seems to be very joined up at the top of the science world. Is that something that you can see when you're, you're partly in that world? Can you see that? That's question one. Question two is when you have very immediate problems to solve, they can often be very innovative times. Will there be some spillover benefits from the huge amount of dollars being poured into into solving this? Will we actually solve some other problems along the way as well, even if it's not by design? So let's start with the, the, the scientific community. The scientific community is by default and has always been a very collaborative over the borders, and it will continue to be so. I think that this will probably even sort of strengthen this global effort to find better therapeutic treatments to find a vaccine within the healthcare system. Sort of the the deglobalization is it's more about that we want to maybe spread the, the manufacturing on a wider scale and therefore be sort of less dependent on certain regions or certain more sort of to to de-risk the situation. I don't think that it's a truly deglobalization effort. It's more sort of to to head yourself sort of should there be any problems. We don't want to have sort of a significant part of our therapeutic manufacturing coming from a certain part of the world. So it's it's more about hedging ourselves rather than sort of a true deglobalization uh, per se. And yes, I agree, desperate time, desperate measures sort of c- can result in very creative solutions. And I don't think that this crisis is any in, in that perspective any different than, than any other crisis. We will sort of find ways around to do things. It may be sort of a little bit bumpy initially, but, but I do think that, that we will always find new ways of, of doing things or, or, or solving problems. Telemedicine is, for example, one thing that's really sort of is quite fascinating during this crisis. Now we have the technology in place to leverage telemedicine from a completely different scale that we have done uh, historically because I think it's a little bit of a habit you know I'm, I'm used to going to see my doctor and I don't necessarily sort of break that habit unless I have to but now we have to break some of our pat- patent habits and we have to think sort of beyond and how can, how can we do things differently maybe I think a lot of people have realized that telemedicine is actually sort of quite convenient I can sort of call my doctor and I can talk to my doctor and we can sort of agree on how to move forward which is of course a much more efficient way of than than me sort of going to see my doctor I can just call him or her instead so there will be different changes to our our behaviors as a result of this I'm absolutely sure. So I just want to go back to Olga and ask around this sort of trajectory of recovery complexion recovery if we were to get some kind of second wave in the fall, winter. How much damage would that do to animal spirits? You own a small business, you were strapped for cash, you were forced to shut down, you reopened, but under very different conditions, and you might have to close again. Is this going to really snuff out the entrepreneurial spirit and do a lot of a lot of damage to what Keynes calls animal spirits? Hugo, that's really that's really the key question for us as we're trying to work out what these medical advances mean for economic recovery. I don't think it's so much about snuffing out animal spirits as it is about turning supply disruption into supply destruction. So if businesses have to postpone making money for a couple of weeks or even a couple of months, and then the fiscal support is there, the monetary support is there to help bridge that gap, that's one thing. 
But if businesses begin to reopen in the summer, as we expect, and then just as they're about to start repairing their their economics, their balance sheets, are having to deal with yet another disruption, another hit to their revenues, another hit to their cash flows, I think that will tip many into bankruptcies. And so then we will start to think about genuine and prolonged supply destruction, right? This may not happen in the larger companies in the listed company space, but certainly in the smaller in the smaller businesses. To the extent that even this disruption that we've had, so the lockdowns of the last month and a half to two months or so, will already have a profound effect on on many small businesses. But just to contextualize this, restaurants, bars, these kinds of of businesses all together in the U.S. account for about two and a half percent of GDP. So while they make a huge contribution to our daily life and will impact closure of many high street storefronts, will really impact how we perceive the recovery, what our choices for consumption are, etc., the headline numbers in terms of the progression of the recovery will feel somewhat disconnected because the recovery in terms of the actual numbers will feel stronger because bigger companies, especially on the supply side, but even in broader in broader areas and more high value added activities will actually prove to be more resilient. But this potential second wave of disruption is very, very real and will materially worsen the impact on a lot of businesses. And we're very cognizant of that as we're thinking about this into the second half of 2020 and the first half of 2021. I guess if you're a government or even a central bank, you also have to be very cognizant of this. And so when it comes to thinking around timing of withdrawal of stimulus and aid, that will be a factor as well. So that would probably argue for a degree of better to be late than be early, particularly when you've got this risk in in the final months of this year. Exactly right. In fact, what we've seen in terms of the initial government responses where they've been more proactive, especially in Northern European countries, for example, we've seen the bridge, the financing bridge for small businesses being extended through June, for example. We may very well, in the adverse event of another set of lockdowns or substantial disruption, even in the absence of lockdowns, but substantial disruption in economic activity should the infection rates prove to be destabilizing in the in the fall we could see potentially another short term bridge announced so the key point here is that the governments all around the world to the extent that they're able are focused on making sure that the supply disruption does not morph into destruction that we do not destroy our productive capacity and our economic capacity and so if and when we conquer, or rather when we put this virus and this epidemic behind us, whether through vaccines, extensive testing, a combination of things, et cetera, we can then have a pretty vigorous recovery, in which case we would then need to think about withdrawing fiscal support and monetary support. But right now it's premature, I would argue, especially based on Camilla's thoughts on the likely resurfacing of this in the second half of this year. Great. Well, look, I think that is a Good place to stop. I want to thank you both again for joining me. This is the second installment of our series on COVID-19. In a way, I hope it's our last, but I suspect it won't be. But I hope everyone has enjoyed listening to it. Thank you both. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening to today's episode of The Active Share. To hear additional insights from William Blair Investment Management, visit us at blog.williamblair.com. The Active Share is available on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, and TuneIn. For questions, comments, or topics you'd like to hear discussed, email us at podcastim at williamblair.com. This content is for informational and educational purposes only and is not intended as investment advice or recommendation to buy or sell any security or to adopt any investment strategy. Investment advice and recommendations can be provided only after careful consideration of investors' objectives, guidelines, and restrictions. The views and opinions expressed are those of the speakers as of the date of this recording, are subject to change without notice as economic and market conditions dictate, and may not reflect the views and opinions of other investment teams within William Blair Investment Management. 
Factual information has been obtained from sources we believe to be reliable, but its accuracy, completeness, or interpretation cannot be guaranteed. Any discussion of particular topics is not meant to be comprehensive and may be subject to change. This material may include forecasts, estimates, outlooks, projections, and other forward-looking statements. Due to a variety of factors, actual events may differ significantly from those presented. Past performance is not indicative of future results. Investing involves risk, including the possible loss of principal. Any investment or strategy mentioned herein may not be suitable for every investor. References to specific companies are for illustrative purposes only and should not be construed as investment advice or a recommendation to buy or sell any security. William Blair Investment Management may or may not own any securities of the companies referenced. It should not be assumed that any investment in the companies referenced was or will be profitable.